Hello, game devs. Today, we're going to be talking about Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> this is an amazing game, and it has been in development since 2002. And it's one of those projects that I admire not because of just the cool concept, but because of the lifelong dedication and the iterative development that the brothers Tarn and Zach Adams have been working with as the owners of Bay 12 Games. So chip the glasses and crack the plates. It's Dwarf Fortress time. <laughs> Okay, so I know you may not have had fun with this in the first hour of gameplay, and that's okay. I get it. It's not a learning curve, it's more of a learning cliff, and you fell right off. And it certainly takes a certain amount of tenacity to get going in this game. But once you do, you realize what an amazing piece of work it is. So if you haven't been able to figure out how to do this game, be sure to watch some of the tutorial videos that I've linked down below. I'm also not the only one who finds this game fascinating. Several academic papers have been written about Dwarf Fortress, including, uh, including studies on AI, computer game landscapes, computer game pedagogy. And it's reportedly helped inspire Minecraft along with games like Infiniminer. The game takes players on an adventure through a series of biomes above and below ground, filled with ancient ruins, minerals, monsters, and more. And you take your courageous band of dwarves into the wilderness and create a forest, raise livestock, grow crops, and defend it against numerous threats, some external and some logistical. You can see the connections to Minecraft already, probably. Uh, mm. And if you're a fan of these kind of games, you can probably see how games like RimWorld, which is developed by Ludian Studios, a lone wolf developer named Tynan Sylvester, but that's a game for another review. When we talk about the story and the narrative in this game, uh, about sandbox games in general, I remember there was an EA developer who was giving a talk on The Sims. And at one point uh, that he tried to get across is that uh, the narratives are of these kind of games aren't developer driven. It's not like a storyline with scripts and cutscenes, so much as it's a game that provides users with opportunities to tell their own stories and discover stories based on random events. And I can tell you a bunch, and I'm sure anyone who plays Dwarf Fortress can as well. You Usually when you're developing a game like this, there's an imperceivable critical mass of game mechanics that you need to implement before those narratives begin to emerge though. So if you're working on something like this, never fear if it's not happening yet. There are three modes in Dwarf Fortress. There's Dwarf Fortress mode, in which you're uh, controlling a colony of dwarves, Adventurer mode, where you play as one character, and Legends mode, which has some more civilization type gameplay that we're not going to get into. But what they all feature is a robust procedurally generated engine. So everything about this world is procedurally generated. And what I mean by that is uh, when you generate the game, everything is made up by the computer and the player uh, and the programmer is merely creating a set of qual uh, qualities that we have to measure. And then uh, the computer grows a world out of those kind of rules. In terms of visuals, if you're following the Steam version of Dwarf Fortress, there is an option for a more visual approach. But I'm going to be talking about the original Dwarf Fortress aesthetic. And this game takes advantage of an early game development technique to auto-generate tons of data that can be really quickly loaded and will run on, uh, according to the um, stats on the Steam page for the graphical version, a Windows XP machine with one gigabyte of RAM. And that's pretty amazing when you think about that the graphical version of the game runs on that. And this feature, makes it highly accessible to people in all over the world who may not be lucky enough to have income capable of buying cutting edge hardware. And this is a deep, deep game. Whether that's another country or right here in the US, I bet you knew at least one computer in your high school running Windows XP on it, right? Uh, well, we're on an accessibility while we're on accessibility of technology, check out charities like Free Geek in Chicago uh, that helps uh, build functional computers for those who need them. This is a, a charity my husband has had personal experience working with and places like that and the original Free Geek Portland, those are sorely needed, especially now. So links down below. But back to the graphics, when we look at expertly done text-based graphics that happen to be in Dwarf Fortress, it's a hallmark style of games that were so simple that they could use only letters to represent objects to draw pictures. This is where we get ASCII art from, and, and it's the kind of graphics that we see in games like Rogue, which inspired so many games, there's a term for that entire genre of games, a roguelike. 
The art is amazing because it is so simple, but it also takes advantage of color and a lot of things that modern text engines can give you. And it kind of elevates an old style to something very uh, um, traditional, but also uh, their own flavor. When you look at Dwarf Fortress maps, you're definitely gonna think, oh, that's a Dwarf Fortress map. This game taps into our lizard brain in multiple levels. From creating a shelter, surviving, and developing an ecosystem of dwarves to do your bidding, uh, it's a pretty universal emotion to want to do these kind of tasks. Whether it's someone that tends their garden and enjoys the progress of uh, it takes over the summer, or watching their dwarves build a base that will eventually be torn down by the ravages of monster, or winter in this metaphor. And Dwarf Fortress tapped into that very early on. It's been free for nearly 20 years, so not only is there a level of mechanical enjoyment with the game, there is also a romantic air about the game. And, uh, you know, you join a community of players who are all looking up to these pair of brothers who, out of the expression of their own artistic merit, created a game meant only to entertain and to enjoy. And what can we learn from this game beyond the influence that it has had on the world and other games like it? The thing to witness here is the importance of the relationship between the developer and the player. This game has been considered brutally hard, but there's a reason this game has got to be assigned, right? If I just wanted to make you throw yourself against a wall, I just assigned you Battletoads or something like that. No. This relationship and how they're currently trying to navigate a paid Steam version is an amazing thing to watch. And they've been very careful throughout the years to uh, maintain this relationship and make it a good one. And there's another special relationship here, that between Tarn and Zack. Much like other famous pairs of siblings, such as the Vlog Brothers, Hank and John Green, this game comes from a good relationship. And there's something uh, story-like about that as well. This game is an amazing product and we can learn so much from it. Go check out the Steam version of the game, which is a monetized graphical version, but it doesn't affect the free version of the game. Unbelievable. Let me know what you think of Dwarf Fortress. Any great stories of a spectacular failure? Let me know and I'll see you in class.